I believe that the best way to create economic growth is to invest. To invest in our schools, invest in our infrastructure, and invest in our communities. If we continue to cut taxes to the point where we can't provide essential government services, we will all be poorer because no one will want to live here. Let me go back to the 2003 report on state and local taxes. This is, was a bipartisan committee and they concluded with this statement. Fostering the state's business climate is a complex equation. There are nine essential components for a growing economy according to the Ohio Business Roundtable. Here are the nine essential components for growing your economy. Leadership, customers, suppliers, infrastructure, talent, technology, capital, research, and business climate. Now, I recognize that slashing taxes on businesses creates a more favorable business climate. Certainly, that's what businesses tell us. But cutting taxes reflexively and consistently at the expense of everything else jeopardizes some of those other essential components of economic growth. And that is the danger that I see for Ohio if we continue down this path. Specifically, if we don't invest in infrastructure, talent, technology, and research, we are going to be left behind. Because the people who could create jobs are going to go to places where they can find talent, technology, infrastructure, and research. The question isn't whether we should raise revenue for those things. We have to. If we want economic growth, we need to make investments. That's not a, that should not be a controversial principle. It's part of the principle that we based our prior growth on. The question is, how do we raise taxes? That's the debate that we need to have, not whether we can ever raise taxes. We have to get past the current belief that cutting taxes is always the answer, and raising taxes is never the answer, and in fact can't even be mentioned. I'm sure I'll get down today and people will tell me, well, you just threw your political career away because you suggested sometimes we might have to raise taxes. Your, your government legislators should know that there are times when you should cut and times when you should raise taxes. And if, if you're gonna have a, an a economic climate that grows, that's what you wanna have. You wanna elect people who know that sometimes you raise them, sometimes you cut them, not necessarily permanently either way, but you need to look at the situation and do what's best for economic growth. And if I'm elected, that's what I'll do. Well, um, I agree. It's definitely not all about cutting taxes. That's uh, unfortunately that's the debate that we that we often have, and it's it's not the debate that we should have, and it's certainly not what I believe. That you can't cut your way to prosperity, um, and that's not what we've sought to do. We've sought so far to innovate. Again, there's a lot more to do uh, for for Ohio, both in terms of where we need to go uh, to have a better economy, uh, and also the various ideas that need to be implemented. But we have raised revenue each segment of government out there has seen increasing revenues because we're doing better. More people are employed. The more people are getting, making money and paying taxes. That's the way you raise revenue. Cutting taxes, as we, as we see in Illinois, exactly what happened there, makes more people unemployed, less people paying taxes, and less money going to local governments and schools. So that is, I think, uh, one of the things that we need, really need to uh, focus on. And I just wanted to focus on ideas, because the way we're really going to succeed as a state is to innovate, to have um, bold ideas, and really the best ideas, regardless of where they come. It doesn't matter what party or, or who comes up with the idea. It should just be a meritocracy of ideas. That's really what we should be focused on, uh, instead of a lot of partisan bickering that we see, especially at the national level. Uh, really briefly, some of the ideas that, that I have. One is to have prisoners work, make something not made in the United States so it doesn't impact uh, any U.S. businesses, uh, make something that's made over, exclusively overseas so that helps us with the budget, which is huge, $3.1 billion that we spend on prisons on the state alone. Have those prisoners make something, they learn skills, it's a voluntary program so there's no exploitation of prisoners, um, and they learn, they get certificates, licenses, so they're least, less likely to reoffend. Uh, we actually help our trade deficit for a lot of products out there that are being made exclusively overseas, and we create jobs because that's the type of investment uh, that we really need, uh, in a, uh, investment in bold ideas uh, that, that will grow our economy and make us the most competitive in this country. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? 
That concludes the uh, structured portion of the debate. I believe one of our students was collecting questions. Do we have any from the audience or do any, uh, we've got several audience members that have some questions. Could we get someone to collect those and bring those forward? Thank you. Any other audience members, if you think of something as uh, the candidates respond to those questions, please don't hesitate. Jot something down on a card and we'll collect your questions and uh, present those as well. We've got 20 minutes or so to do that. So the format of this uh, uh, section, we'll start with, uh, I don't suppose we need another coin toss, we'll start with uh, Ms. Gentry. Uh, I guess it kind of depends on who the questions are. are uh, addressed here too. Okay, we've got a question and, and the format after the uh, first candidate responds to the question that is addressed to them will obviously give uh, the other candidate a chance to respond to, uh, to their response, for lack of a better word. Uh, this one is uh, addressed to Mr. Butler. Did you vote for or against SB5 and would you please please explain your position on SB5? Sure, I, I did vote for SB5. Um, I did so because it contained one key point, and that was the uh, elimination of fair share, uh, or the ability for uh, somebody who wants a job working for the government to not have to uh, either join a union or pay union dues. Um, nothing at all wrong with joining a union, of course, but I think that's up to the uh, individual uh, worker out there uh, not to be made to be forced to join uh, a union or any type of third party organization that's, that's out there. Um, with that, on SB5, um, one of the things that, uh, that I, I guess if I had to say my biggest um, error or, or uh, mistake in my first term was not being, uh, or, not, or trying to follow the chain of command uh, like, I, like the military taught me uh, in the legislature. You need to go right to the top, and I should have gone right to the top earlier because I have a, a different idea uh, for uh, instead of SB5 that I was really trying to, uh, to have happen, and that's to have our safety services treated like the military and have everybody else just have no government interference whatsoever, to have the ability to bargain about whatever you want, to associate however you want, um, and that, that I think would drive competition among uh, groups and unions uh, out there to make them better. Of course, that's, that's always a, a better thing, but also, and mo most importantly, to preserve, uh, I think, the freedom to uh, associate yourself with a group or not. Uh, so uh, that's the reason why I voted for SB5 and what I uh, would have done differently uh, had it, have, if it came up again. Okay. I would have voted against SB5, uh, and let me tell you why. Uh, I believe that unions are very important. They were important when they were formed uh, in the early 20th century, and they're important today. Unions help to level the playing field and to give workers a voice in their workplace. Now, it's easy to talk about freedom and say, well, workers are just as free to speak up as bosses are, but they're not. Workers do much better if they can band together and bargain collectively. Um, that is one reason why we have a strong middle class, because we have um, a history of unions who obtained victories like the five-day work week, um, the 40-hour work week, uh, you know, paid holidays. Uh, Unions have fought for things that have made lives, their lives better and the lives of their families better. And they've also been able to bargain for good wages. When the middle class is strong and they have good wages, then they can support the economy and a growing economy. Uh, and some will say, well, it's not fair to give workers the right to bargain for better wages. Why on earth not? They help to create the economic prosperity. Most of the benefits of that prosperity tend to flow to the top. But there's no reason why the people who created that prosperity shouldn't have a share in it. Unions help to make that possible by leveling the playing field. So I believe that the right to union, and, and in addition, when it, with regard to safety forces, police and firefighters and teachers, quite frankly, need to be able to bargain about their working conditions. Um, when you talk to police and firefighters today, they will talk about not having enough staffing and how that puts their own lives in danger. Not having the right equipment and how that puts their own lives in danger. Our, our safety forces and all of our workers need to be able to bargain for their working conditions and their wages, and I would have voted against SB5. Thank you both. We'll address this question first to Ms. Gentry. What is the number one issue facing Ohioans, and what specifically will you do to address this? 
Um, well, I've already talked about some of the biggest issues. School funding, I think, is the biggest issue. But let me, um, let me turn to jobs, because that's also a very big issue. And I do have a, a three-point plan for bringing back jobs, not just to Ohio, but to the Miami Valley. Because this is where I'm from. This is where I grew up. I want to see Dayton and the Miami Valley succeed. Um, what I want to do is recruit, restore, and invest. Number one is to recruit manufacturers who are bringing jobs back from China and India. It's a trend called uh, insourcing, or some call it onshoring. But many of those manufacturing jobs that went away a decade, decade ago are coming back because of quality concerns and because the costs of making those products have gone up, uh, in part because of energy costs have gone up, but also because wages have gone up in those countries. So there is an incentive for manufacturers to bring their jobs back to the United States. That's great. They should come here. Uh, and uh, my opponent said early on that you know telling people how great the area is isn't very effective. I think it could be. I think that if we go out there and we aggressively recruit the companies, we can bring them here because we have extensive manufacturing experience. We have a manufacturing base. We have other advanced manufacturers in the area. We're at the I-70, I-75 corridor, which is terrific for transportation. We have excellent educational institutions here in the Miami Valley. There are many reasons, oh, and we have a low cost of living. So there are many reasons why we can bring people here. So number one is recruit. The second thing I would do is restore funding to local governments and schools so that they can hire teachers, police, and firefighters. Those are jobs. We need them to be filled. And finally, I would invest. I think that we need to find a way, whether it's through bonds or something else, to rebuild our infrastructure and our communities and make this a place where people want to come live and work. Thank you. Well, yeah, before I address the question, I just wanted to quickly follow up on um, unions. And, and uh, certainly, workers do have more leverage when they bind together and, and, uh, and negotiate as a group. And that's exactly what I believe. That's exactly what should happen. But they should have the right to bind together with whomever they want. Uh, instead of being forced to bind together with somebody they don't want and have somebody represent them that they, that they don't uh, approve of. Uh, so um, just wanted to address that real quick. The answer to the question is, is certainly jobs in the economy. Uh, and the way to do that is to give businesses a competitive edge for being in Ohio. Businesses are smart. They know where they're going to make the most money. And that's where they'll move, especially businesses such as manufacturing that we really need to have uh, grow uh, in, our, in our economy. It's very important for Ohio that that's the case. So the way you have you give a competitive edge, um, tax structure and, and those types of things are important, but there's a lot of other stuff that's involved. Um, for instance, um, transportation costs. I have an idea to uh, transition over uh, the state and local fleets to compress natural gas, which is 70 cents a gallon. Uh, have a loan program to do that, and potentially also a loan program for private businesses to be able to, to uh, transition over and convert their vehicles to compressed natural gas. So if you're a business in Ohio and you're paying 70 cents a gallon versus somebody else is paying $4 a gallon, you have a competitive edge. The, uh, also education, which is a lot, much uh, bigger topic than to have one minute uh, to talk about it, but having education, having workers come out from high school even with an associate's degree uh, or have apprenticeships and co-ops and internships so that when they're 18 or 19 they already have a competitive edge over other students in other states. We can do that if we invest in early childhood education and all-day kindergarten uh, and, and start earlier and then finish early and then be able to have uh, that advanced training uh, in the high school years for some of the students on a voluntary basis. Um, having a major uh, airport is also really important, a major hub airport. If anybody's ever flown anywhere, you usually have to lay over somewhere. Well, businesses have employees that need to fly places, and having to lay over somewhere all the time uh, it hurts their business and, and creates unpredictability. And so that's another way that we can make Ohio more competitive and give businesses and people a competitive edge. We'll pose this question to Mr. Butler first. As the House representative from uh, District 41, what will you do with the current surplus in Ohio's budget in order to best serve the citizens of our community and the students of our schools? Well, certainly the budget surplus has gotten a lot of talk. As soon as uh, that came about, and again, just to reiterate, it came about because of the policies that we enacted. I mean, we, we had an $8 billion budget deficit. Now we do have some money in the rainy day fund. Um, but going out and spending it right away is just going to put us in the same boat that we are already were in. Uh, if you do, that's, that's just not prudent. That's not what families do. Why should government do that? 
Um, certainly, and I'm sure, as I said before, um, when we did have extra revenue that came in during the budget cycle in 2011, we did add money to the education budget. We added $91 million in, in the first year and $74 million in the second year. So certainly, I'm sure that will be part of the equation. But I don't think completely draining the uh, rainy day fund immediately is a good idea. It's good to have some savings and also as, a, as our economy continues to grow and we continue to do better to be able to redirect some of those resources uh, and invest in schools and local government and some of the other ideas that I discussed. Um, my answer is very brief. We should return most of that money to the local government fund and to schools. My opponent mentioned it's in the rainy day fund. It is, and it's raining. That money needs to go back to the local governments and schools who lost the money because the state took it. Um, and one other point I would make on that is that it's government's role to tax and spend. Tax and spend, not tax and keep. It's not appropriate for the government to tax the money and then hold on to it. They should spend it when it's needed, and right now it's needed. Um, and I do want to respond to one thing that my opponent said on the educational ideas he was mentioning, like all day kindergarten and vocational education. I completely agree with those ideas. We do need to be more competitive. We need to have those options available. And to do that, we need to fund them. Um, one of the votes um, that my opponent cast was to eliminate all day kindergarten. I would not have cast that vote. Thank you both. We've got a couple more questions. I think we've got a couple more in the audience as well. Could we get one of the students to please, uh, if you've got a question, would you hold it up high? And the students will come grab that real quick. Here's another question uh, for both of you. We'll start with Ms. Gentry. What motivates you to run for this office? Um, last year, I watched as Governor Kasich made one decision after another that just really made me mad. The first thing he did was to get rid of the train. The train would have been wonderful for this area. Um, it would have brought 6,000 jobs to the state. It would have made us more competitive for businesses. And it, it, it just would have been a wonderful addition to this area. And he cavalierly just said, no, we're not going to do that um, before he even took office. He also, as, I, as, as was discussed, um, supported Senate Bill 5, which I disagree with. Um, he supported HB 194, which um, weakened the right to vote. The right to vote is something that I that I have fought for as an attorney. I've spent six years fighting to protect the right to vote, um, specifically with regard to voter ID and provisional ballots. Uh, the right to vote is sacred. It's fundamental because it ensures every other civil right that we have. And when they passed HB 194, which my opponent still supports, um, that, that, that was one of the reasons why I decided I needed to run. And the final reason was the cuts to the schools and to the local governments. I have two children who are in public schools um, and they both love living here, and they want to live here when they grow up. They don't ever want to leave. They want to stay here and work, and I want them to do that. But I'm afraid that on the path that we're on, if we let our schools go downhill, and we let our communities go downhill, they're not going to be able to stay, because it won't be a place where people want to live, and there aren't going to be jobs for them. So part of the reason I decided to run was for my children and all of your children. Mr. Butler. Thank you. Uh, well, I actually already addressed uh, that in, in my uh, opening remarks, um, that Ohio was dying. I mean, there's, I mean, I don't think anybody disputes how poor, poorly things were going and how uh, much of a problem we had with the $8 billion budget deficit, because somebody's got to pay that money. Uh, and so one of the things that, about the Lincoln-Douglas debates um, that, that was really interesting, and first of all, it's a lot longer, of course, so three hours long, but one of the things that Lincoln and Douglas both did was to, to pose interrogatories to, to one another, uh, which was very interesting. So I have actually a couple of questions, that maybe within the questions we can address, but the train is going to, by the Governor Strickland's own uh, proposal for the money to the federal government would have cost the state $350 million that they would have had to pay to get that train. So regardless if it's a good idea or not, we're in, in, when we have an $8 billion budget deficit, how do you come up with $350 more, million more dollars to pay for the train? And then regarding um, you know, both school funding and local government funding, when you have a deficit, um, in, in, unlike some other states, Ohio, uh, has their local communities and school districts can raise taxes. That's not a, every state. So when you have an extremely difficult time and a tough economy, um, isn't it actually more democratic to let each local community and school make the decision whether they want to raise taxes uh, or have less services? Uh, isn't that something that uh, would just would be more fair? 
uh, in terms of if you have the deficit, either the state can impose it from above and make everybody pay it and make everybody have the services, or have each local government or, lo or each community actually uh, decide for themselves what they would do. Well, let's change the format. Let give you one minute to respond. I know he posed a couple questions to you. You mind if we give her a minute oh, to respond? Yeah, to that? Of course. That'd Go be ahead. Terrific. Thank you. Um, first, taking the first, the last point first. The reason why we don't impose the burden on local communities to raise taxes to fund their schools is because our Constitution says the state should do it. And the reason why the state should do it is because it's unequal, inequitable to require local communities to come up with the money to fund their own schools. It's been in our Constitution since 1851, and we should adhere to it. Um, so that's the reason, one reason among others, that we shouldn't do that. <clears throat> with regard to the train, um, this point is something that's been made before, and I've been told that that's not true. The money was going to come, I believe it was $400 million from the federal government, period. It was coming. We didn't have to put up matching funds in order to get the $400 million. Um, so that's something that I think is simply not true. All right. Uh, new question. We'll start with Mr. Butler on this one. <laughs> Businesses have been leaving Ohio and the Miami Valley for decades, despite our leaders telling them how great the area is. What specific actions would you take to reverse this trend and recruit them back? Well, again, it's, uh, businesses are smart. Uh, so recruiting them says, here's, here's exactly how you're going to make more money if you're in Ohio. Um, and that's not only the bottom line for them, but that they're also going to have the best workers that have the highest qualifications. Uh, that's something that's very important. As I go around and talk to various business leaders, they have jobs. They just actually they can't find people who are, who are willing and able to do it. Uh, so I think that's a failure that we have, we have as a state and we, need, and we need to address in terms of workforce development. And I think uh, having the, uh, the ability for uh, career tech and for um, uh, an associate's degree so that you can finish half of your college degree while you're in high school uh, and not have to pay for it, which has been, is just absolutely a killer uh, for a lot of people with the student debt out there, I think that that is an, a, a reform that we should really address. With my remaining time, I, I do want to address a little bit about the education funding. Well, you know, property tax or local governments in general have funded schools since the existence of Ohio. I mean, since Ohio was a state, that's exactly what uh, the, has happened. Now, the, the Constitution does not say, actually, that uh, you, have, you can't fund schools with property tax. And if you didn't fund schools with property tax, again, there'd be a massive tax increase, income tax or sales inc uh, tax increase, and most of the money would flow out of the 41st House District to other communities. That's uh, uh, undisputable. I think that's exactly what we don't want to do. Um, one of the things about the, the train, though, uh, I'll actually forward you the, the proposal from Governor Strickland's administration that said that there, there's four, four, in order to get the $400 million in federal funding, we would have had to put up 350 of our own money. That's how the, the train was going to cost that much. And that was just a preliminary estimate. And you know how those go. Um, I'm sure it would have continued to multiply. The state would be on the hook for all the additional money out there. Uh, so of course, I'll forward, forward you that email. We, we uh, email regularly, so thanks. I should note that Jim and I actually do know each other and like each other. We've known each other since before politics because we're both attorneys and we've been on cases together and go to the same church, live in the same neighborhood. Um, so this has been actually a, a good race, I think, for both of our perspectives because we respect and like each other, even though we vehemently disagree on just about everything. Um, let, me, let me address the question. I already talked about investment and the important, importance of investment. Two other things that I want to mention. Number one is leadership. Um, we need leaders who will go out aggressively and recruit businesses, and I don't think we've had that. Uh, I did go through Leadership Dayton, um, and some of us have continued to meet about economic development issues since I graduated five years ago from Leadership Dayton. Um, and during one of those meetings, we had someone come in and talk about the, different, the, the similarities between Dayton with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Huntington, Alabama, which has a base down there. Um, and, and talked about how uh, and that, and that they do space. That's their issue is space, we're the Air Force. But they have so many um, businesses, big businesses like General, uh, General Dynamics and all kinds of big businesses that have come there and set up shop there because they have to in order to get the money from, uh, from the base down there which distributes money. And they have a senator, Senator Richard Shelby, who has been aggressively and over a long time period recruiting businesses and making them come there. We haven't had that leadership. 
And there are a lot of dollars that flow out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, billions of dollars, and it goes to California or other places. It could have come here if we had done things differently. We didn't, but it's not too late to try to do some of that. The other thing we need to do is go back to what Gover Governor Strickland did, which is to identify clusters of economic industries in different parts of the state. Our focus on this part of the state is advanced manufacturing, advanced materials, and aerospace, among other things. Um, and, and that is something that we need to highlight as a state. Different parts of the state have different capabilities, and everyone in Ohio should sell Dayton as a place to come for those things. Thank you. Let's do this. I know we uh, we're up against the clock. Uh, could we do maybe just two minutes, a closing statement for both of them? They can wrap up any uh, any points that they want to make. Let's start with uh, Mr. Butler on that. Well, thank you very much. And again, thanks to, to all of you for attending. Um, I just wanted to uh, address some of the, uh, in terms of economic development. Certainly, if you can, as a state representative, you would want to, uh, you certainly work with the, the businesses that are actually here in Ohio to help them grow. I think that's a more important job than actually uh, heading out of the state and trying to recruit businesses because there are a ton of economic development groups in Ohio and locally. I think there are 23 different economic development groups where their whole job is to do exactly what my opponent's talking about, um, and they haven't been successful. And that's another uh, issue that I think needs to be addressed in terms of uh, regional cooperation. Um, my opponent mentioned Alabama and, and the ability for Alabama to get jobs. Well, Alabama uh, doesn't have an estate tax. They have a really favorable uh, uh, tax environment. Uh, they have the ability to, uh, to join a union or not. Um, so a lot of the things that we've been trying to do or have done for Ohio, and I think that's why Ohio is starting to uh, turn around, although again, we have a long way to go. Um, I just wanted to take my, my final minute here to uh, say thank you to, to my opponent, to Caroline Gentry, for running a, a really great campaign. Uh, regardless of how things turn out, I, I wanted to, uh, to certainly to thank you. Uh, again, most of, a lot of campaigns, and this is a good example on this debate on the issues here, uh, they're just mudslinging and, and, you know, these personal attacks and everything. We're all really tired of it, and, and that uh, never happened in our, our race. Um, and it's not just, I think, because uh, we like each other, but I think uh, just I want to see the caliber of, of Caroline in terms of her uh, uh, honor uh, in running a great campaign. So I wanted to close by thanking Caroline. Well, thank you too, Jim, and I have to commend Jim for his integrity, and, and like I said, um, I respect him greatly, even, even if I disagree with him. I know that he wants to do the right thing, and we both want the same thing for Ohio. We both want Ohio to be a great place for our kids and for the future. Um, so we disagree on how to get there, but in the end, uh, it's been a great race, so thank you, Jim, for that. I want to end where Jim began, which is telling you just a little about myself and then what I want to do when I get into office. Um, I did grow up in the Miami Valley. We moved here when I was young because my father was in the Air Force. So we transferred here and I've been here ever since. I went to public schools all throughout, got an excellent education for which I am very grateful. And that education allowed me to go on to Yale for law school. Um, after I graduated from Yale, I came back and I worked for Judge Rice for two years in the federal court. And then for the past 15 years, I've been working as an attorney downtown. I've been very involved in the community, um, including the March of Dimes and the Entrepreneur Center. Uh, my stepfather has a small business, so I am very cognizant of the, uh, the effects of taxes on businesses and regulation on businesses, and I absolutely want businesses to succeed because it's so important for families. Um, as I mentioned, I have two young children. Uh, they're not so young. My son is 13 and my daughter is 11. My son is autistic. And one of the reasons we moved to Oakwood was because they had excellent public schools and they would give him the help that he needed. Where we lived did not have the financial resources to give him the help that he needed. Um, one of the tragedies in our state that I want to fix when I get elected is that insurance companies in Ohio can refuse to cover treatment for autism and they can refuse to cover treatment for diabetes. Um, and uh, it's one of four states that can refuse to cover treatment for diabetes. That needs to change and the autism issue needs to change. There's actually a bill that recently introduced by two Republican legislators to require coverage of autism. I applaud that and when I'm elected I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join that fight. Thank you all for being here and we really appreciate, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank uh, 
Ms. Gentry and Mr. Butler for being here. It does my heart good as a social studies teacher to see democracy in action. I try to you know, always tell my students, you know, no matter who you support, no matter what you think on the issues, it's a beautiful thing that we can get together and discuss these, these issues openly, uh, and that doesn't happen in most countries. So thank you both for being here. We appreciate your time. Uh, students, thank you for being here. Adults, thank you. We appreciate your attendance. Uh, it was a good event. Uh, again, we appreciate it. Students, make sure you stop and see me before you leave so I can get your names. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Thanks again. Uh, good event. We appreciate uh, all of you being here. Thanks. Thank you.